today's broadcast. Very excited to see you here for another great conversation. What the heck is happening in the cryptocurrency markets specifically? I want to talk about, well, the SEC has the latest decision on all Bitcoin ETFs for 45 days. So that's the really big news of the day. But I also want to share some reasons with you why I'm actually pretty optimistic about 2024 and the potential of the markets in 2024. Also, let's talk about World War III. That sounds like an uplifting topic. Dive into a bit of that as well. Looking at some really crazy macroeconomic stuff that has been happening in the background right now. Not getting enough media attention, but certainly something I want to discuss with you here. So let's get into this. The first big story that actually, before we do that, one quick shout out, of course, to everybody joining on the live stream. Super excited to see you guys here. Love it. Love it. Love it. everyone shows up for these great conversations on crypto. Of course, if you are watching this later over on Rumble, happy to see you there as well. And of course, if you're listening to this on the podcast on Apple or on Spotify, welcome to the party. So let's get into it. The BlackRock Bitcoin ETF, the Invesco Bitcoin ETF, the Valkyrie, the uh, Fidelity, all the Bitcoin ETF applications have been delayed by the SEC for 45 days. Now, we were discussing this in the last stream that I thought that was probably a very likely scenario that we're going to see them delayed. It, it, it would just seem a bit weird to me that the SEC would get smacked down in court two days before they're supposed to roll, rule on a Bitcoin ETF. Of course, they were waiting for the grayscale case to play out. Once that played out, they're not going to make an instantaneous decision. They're going to need some time to decide, well, how are we going to react? Are we going to appeal this for certain? Are we just going to take the L and you know try to spin this as some kind of win where it's like, well, we're just going to follow the rule of law now. See, we're good actors. We're going to approve a Bitcoin ETF. Aren't we good boys over here at the SEC? Which of course, they're not. But maybe that's all to try to spin it. Remains to be seen of course, but definitely, 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 you know, impacted the market a lot today. When we got word that those spot Bitcoin ETF applications were delayed by the SEC, well, here's what the markets did. Badunk da dunk right back down. You could have gone on holiday for three days, come back, and the price would be exactly the same as when you left. That whole grayscale Bitcoin ETF speculation pump, right back down, baby. Right back down. Back down, of course, to our key area of price support. We still have not seen the price close under the very, very key level of $25,000. If we start closing under $25K, things can get a little bit dicey. Right now, still maintaining above 25K. In fact, today's sell-off only brought us down to $25,600, which was higher than the sell-off of August 22nd, which was $25,400, and higher than the sell-off of August 17th, which was $25,200. So it wasn't even that bad. It wasn't. What? Who's selling their Bitcoin because the Bitcoin ETF got delayed, man? Basically, everybody knew it was going to get delayed. The surprise would have been them actually doing something about it. Delay, I felt like, was the most likely path forward. And yet, here the market goes. Got to overreact to everything happening in the market. Of course we do. Bitcoin now back under the 200-day exponential moving average. One of those key bull bear lines. At least we're still holding support at 26K for the time being. Of course, if we continue this price action, we are in danger of pretty quickly losing that bull cross that we had down here on the MACD, on the daily. We'll see how that plays out. Need some, need bulls to step it up here. But I feel like there's not going to be a lot of stepping it up here until we get some real, real definitive news in the market where the SEC comes out and says, yes, definitively approving a Bitcoin ETF or yes, we're, or so no, actually, no, we're never going to approve any Bitcoin ETFs, not under my reign. Gary Gensler is not going to take the L. He's going to make everybody take the L except him. The American people, of course, lose in that situation. And I don't think BlackRock likes losing. So we'll see if BlackRock gets their way or if Gary Gensler gets their ways. My money's on BlackRock. I feel like they're slightly more powerful and influential than Gary at the SEC. Goldman Gary. Goldman Gary. Uh, fun week in crypto. 
isn't it? And it, the sentiment's just so funny for me because if you bought on the grace, if you bought on the BlackRock news initially, because we're basically back to the price where the, the price of Bitcoin was before the BlackRock news even came out, right? So if you bought on the BlackRock news, you're like, whoa, BlackRock's going to get a Bitcoin ETF. That's going to be massive. That's going to send the price of Bitcoin going to the moon. So I'm going to buy here at 26, 27, 28, 29, 30 thousand dollars, whatever it might be. Okay, sure. Or if you bought on the Grayscale news, holy cow, Grayscale won their case. This is amazing. I bought Bitcoin. It's going to go to 100K. This news is so fundamentally bullish long term that I'm going to buy and hold a position. But you're not going to sell if the SEC delays the ETF decision. Right. Right. Well, a lot of people answered that question. No, I'm going to panic sell immediately based on the news all the time. Panic buy, panic sell, panic buy, panic sell, buy high, sell low, buy high, sell low. It's the mantra of the bear market, baby. You got to buy high. You got to sell low. That is how winning is done. Not actually. That's how you lose all your money. A lot of people are getting chopped up in these markets trying to chase every tiny little couple percent move you're picking up pennies in front of a steamroller man and obviously hey trading's great lots of opportunities out there to make money with trading obviously but if you're moving in and out of huge positions all the time and trying to be a long-term investor but are getting chopped up on the daily because you're running around with panic all the time you gotta chill out man you gotta chill out think about this big picture we got going here for these markets because the Bitcoin ETF will come at some point. It's just a question of when. Now, this is from Eric Balkunis. So he is an ETF analyst for Bloomberg. Him and James Seifert, also a Bloomberg analyst. So these guys, what they do, their thing, they're analysts for ETFs. They sit around and with their big old brains, bringing stuff out, thinking, hmm, what's going on with the ETF markets? Well, these nerds these guys they've upped their odds to 75 percent for a spot bitcoin etf launching this year and if we have to extend it out to next year they say it's a 95 percent chance by the end of 2024 that's pretty crazy that's pretty crazy those are Batman's odds right there i like it 75% this year, pretty good. I think that may even be over, slightly overly optimistic. I honestly would not be surprised to see SEC push this until the last possible damn moment, which would be March next year. Wouldn't be surprised, wouldn't be blown away, but I really feel like this is probably the moment when we get a Bitcoin ETF approved. And these times that we're living through right now are the pre-Bitcoin ETF era, the final moments of it which means the final moments of the price being down where it is. Not saying we can't go a bit lower, not saying the price is going to take off in the immediate short term. I'm talking six months here, a year from now, where's price going to be? Once that Bitcoin ETF does get approved, expect the God candle, the candle of candles. It'll come. It'll come. Imagine the hype whenever Bitcoin ETFs are being sold by BlackRock. When the news starts spreading that the biggest asset manager in the world is selling Bitcoin ETFs, that the third biggest asset manager in the world, Fidelity, is selling Bitcoin ETFs, and everybody else, of course. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. Now, the uh, analysts here from Bloomberg, they also said that the unanimity and the decisiveness of the ruling for the Grayscale case leaves the SEC with very little wiggle room to actually continue to deny spot Bitcoin ETFs in the future because they finally got called on their BS by a judge. The judge basically said, well, if if all the stuff out there for fraud manipulation is good enough for Bitcoin futures ETFs, there's absolutely no reason why it's not good enough for a Bitcoin spot ETF. Maybe the SEC will really just decide to pull everyone's pants down and give them a good old screw and and actually take away Bitcoin futures ETFs as well, which actually would not be a bad thing because Bitcoin futures ETFs are paper garbage. No Bitcoin spot or futures ETFs. I guess that would be a bargain to take, but we'll get the Bitcoin spot ETF simply because I think it's BlackRock and BlackRock. Larry Fink's not a man you tell no to. Uh, James, the other Bloomberg analyst here, he says next dates to watch are 
October. So we have middle of October now. So the 45 delay day delay by the SEC. So that brings us up to BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF second deadline coming on the 17th of October, along with uh, Vanek, Wisdom Tree, Invesco, and Wise Valkyries is on the 19th of October. And um, what do we got here? Bitwise is on the 16th of October. So a lot of them coming up pretty gosh darn soon. Yeah. Will they get approved in October? Well, these guys think there's a pretty good chance, 75% chance, because the third deadline after that comes in January, mid-January, and the final deadline comes in the middle of March next year, which is a month before the Bitcoin halving. That would be the timing, wouldn't it? I mean, really, if they approved a Bitcoin ETF a month before the freaking Bitcoin halving, man, dude, dude, I tell you. Reminder, too, that Mike Novogratz, big venture capital guy, uh, founder of Galaxy Digital, he said that his sources inside BlackRock, his sources inside of Fidelity, two of the major asset managers, number one and number three globally asset managers trying to get Bitcoin ETF products approved, the people in those organizations said, the Bitcoin ETFs are coming. It's not a question of if they're going to be approved this time. BlackRock's in the game. It's going to get approved. It's a question if, not when, and they said four to six months. Now, that four to six month deadline that they gave basically meant that all the big players knew that the delay was going to happen for the first round. But they're looking ahead, possibly January next year, more likely in March. The SEC may just to screw with everybody and to continue to annoy all of us, push it right until the last damn minute. And then finally be forced to, okay, fine, you have a Bitcoin ETF. We're going to delay it as long as possible because we're spiteful bastards. Wouldn't be surprised. Now, by the way, if you are a cryptocurrency trader, you got to get yourself an account over on Bybit. It is the best place to be doing your trading. They got crazy good spot altcoin markets, with all kinds of exotic altcoins. They got very popular futures markets. A very interesting and popular uh, copy trading service as well. And if you use the link down below in the description, you're going to get yourself eligible for up to $30,000 in trading and deposit bonuses, as well as exclusive trading fee discounts. So check it out if you are a trader, that is. I want to share this as well. So Forbes has come out. Is it time to start dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin? Where you been at, Forbes? August 30, 2023. Come on, Forbes. Get with the program. We've been DCA in this bad boy all year. All year. Every week. A little bit more Bitcoin. A little bit more Bitcoin. A little bit more Bitcoin. DCA is the way. Especially during a bear market. Now is the time to be accumulating. Because we are in the accumulation period. At least that's what I'm seeing in the charts. Not financial advice. Of course, can't tell you what to do with your money. Just letting you know what I'm doing with my money. But Forbes out here saying that, well, might be a good time to start dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin. And I agree. They're a bit late to the party, but I agree. I agree. We are now in this period where we are going to get a Bitcoin ETF approved. Most likely, there's always a chance that Gary Gensler decides to go down with a ship and just burn the whole damn thing down. Okay, sure. But more likely than not, we are going to see a Bitcoin ETF actually getting approved. And when that happens, got to be off to the races for the Bitcoin markets. And these kind of prices will be the prices where in 12, 18, 24 months, people are looking back and they're saying, if only I had bought when it was 25K, I saw the BlackRock news, but I didn't buy any Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 All oh, been there before. I like this chart shared from Glass Node here. By BitcoinNews.com. Uh, so Bitcoin withdrawals from exchanges are outpacing deposits at the highest rates since the FTX collapse. That's nuts. So right now, there are currently 58,000 Bitcoin being withdrawn for every 45,000 deposited. So again, we are in some crazy, crazy situation right here for the total 
exchange volume. The total amount of Bitcoin on exchanges keeps going down. Right now, we are continuing to see a big disparity between Bitcoin coming into exchanges and Bitcoin being taken off of exchanges. It's pretty crazy stuff. Think about the potential impact of that long. And we're in a market situation right now where most people aren't paying attention. Most people aren't here. Most people don't want to hear anything about crypto. They don't hear anything about Bitcoin. People have been burned. They left. They bought high. They sold low. I get it. I get it. It hurts. But people who are still here paying attention, you who are still here paying attention, you have the ability to see this information, to understand that during this still relatively boring and bearish time in the market when volumes are low, interest is low from the public, traditional finance managers are getting in, major asset managers are getting in, big stories are happening, big adoption is happening. And we are seeing on-chain data irrefutably proving that Massive amounts of Bitcoin continue to be being stacked during this period. I wanted to share this chart with you as well from the dudes over at Stack Money Lizards. Basically, just showing a nice, nice little chart here of where Bitcoin could go in the next cycle, based on, of course, a bit of inspiration from from uh, older uh, cycles. So maybe we get back up to around 48K by the time of the Bitcoin having, for example, then our new all-time high sometime potentially in 2025, new highs overall for Bitcoin sometime late in 2024, maybe four months, for example, after the Bitcoin having in April, we'll see Bitcoin back over 70K. Then we start the slow grind up to the new all-time high, whatever that's going to be. I'm still thinking 150K is a nice, modest price target. Maybe things get a little bit crazier near the peak, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. I like that chart. It's a good one. And I wanted to share this with you from Coinfessions to wrap this segment up. He says, me and my buddies made tens of millions of dollars in the last bull market. Truth is, we're not good at anything except for being early. Now, I personally spend my days LARPing as a trader on uh, Twitter. X. We are living proof that you don't have to be extraordinary at anything in life. You just have to be early. I've got good news for you. It's a very true story. I look back to the last cycle for me, and actually during the crazy days of the bull market, I actually got chopped up quite a bit by chasing around a lot of stuff, trying to hop onto new narratives and stuff like that instead of just sitting on the bags that I had packed during the bear market. I packed up huge amounts of Ethereum, for example, bunches of Matic. And okay, I sold my Matic for a lot of profits, and that was great. And I sold my Cardano for lots of profits, and that was great. And I got some nice venture investments. That was great. But, you know, some of my simplest plays, just buying truckloads of Ethereum and you know, unloading some of it for the simplest ways to make money. And I really think that right now, again, nothing goes up. If you buy today, your prices could go down tomorrow. Keep that in mind. I'm looking long term. I'm buy, build, buying a link position recently, for example. And that chain link position currently sitting at a loss. That's okay. That's okay. Because I'm looking at not what's happening tomorrow, next week, next month even the next few months, I'm looking at where is this particular asset going to be that I think has got some fundamental strength to it at the next cycle peak or not necessarily peak. I'm not going to time the top perfectly, obviously, but if I can get out at a great profit, fantastic. And simply being early in which we are now early in the cycle, even if prices go down a bit, no one's going to perfectly buy the bottom and then perfectly sell the top. Maybe like one dude. So the odds are massively against you. But if you can find those fundamentally strong assets, dollar cost average into them, think long term. You're early right now. You're early to this cycle. Late 2024, early 2025, it's going to be late to the cycle. That's when people like you and me are going to be selling to the people who are showing up then because they're late. But you're early right now. Okay. Let's get into the next topic. And I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the reasons why I remain just quite broadly optimistic on 2024 and the coming cycle. You see, there's a lot of big things that are happening in the Bitcoin space in particular, and that's going to be good for 
the entire cryptocurrency space. And some of these stories do overlap a bit with crypto more broadly. But what's good for Bitcoin tends to be good for everything else. Bitcoin ETFs are going to bring in billions of new money into the crypto space. Yeah, it's going to enter into Bitcoin. But as we've seen over time and through reports, money doesn't tend to stay exclusively in Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin maximalists, others might argue, well, it should only be in Bitcoin forever. Nothing else. Everything else is a scam. Okay. Look, the reality is the majority of people, they want bigger gains because they see what goes on in crypto. They see people making the 10, 20, 50, 100x gains, and they're not that rare. People make big money all the time in this market. And people want a piece of that pie. Now, look, not everybody can get a piece of that pie because if you're talking about like low cap coins and stuff like that, you can't be uh, a millionaire or a billionaire and buy a hundred million dollars worth of some tiny low cap altcoin. But you can buy a hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin. The kind of people who are buying does change a little bit when you start getting into bigger numbers. But if we talk about most people, most people see the big gains elsewhere, but still a lot of money is going to flow into Bitcoin specifically. And for a few, I think, very clear reasons here. I think the stage is set massively for Bitcoin. So let's just go over a few of the big, big things that I see happening in this space right now that makes me think the stage is set perfectly for crazy crazy times in 2024. First is that the SEC is getting their butts handed to them right now. I mean, hey, I know they won some sort of case the other day. Well, they didn't win. They got basically some NFT project to acquiesce and not fight them in court. They said the NFT project even said it's going to be cheaper for us just to give them a few million bucks to go away instead of go and spend a lot of time and energy of our company to actually fight them in court, which is what most people do. But the uh, Ripple team did not take that route. They spent like $100 million or whatever in legal fees fighting the SEC in court, a waste of everybody's time and money, and they won. That XRP ruling is good for the entire altcoin and the entire crypto space. Then we had the Grayscale case where, again, the SEC lost. That's good for the potential for Bitcoin ETFs, and that's good for the potential of the whole space because that could bring in estimated $30 billion of new money into the market and $30 billion of buy pressure sends the price of Bitcoin a lot higher. Let's just say that. And then of course, that all sets the stage for Coinbase, which is also being sued by the SEC to basically slam a home run win for their case because everything the SEC has been arguing has basically already been disproven. And Uniswap, they won a case the other day where somebody was trying to sue them because they bought uh, some shit coin on Uniswap and they lost money. So Uniswap's responsible for that. How dare you allow me to come and use your decentralized protocol and then I lose money. Somebody's got to be to blame. Not me. Not me. I'm not to blame the person who clicked the button. It's the guys who wrote the code. The judge disagreed. In fact, the judge slapped it down. And that same judge is the person who's going to be presiding over the Coinbase case. So we have lots of little precedent that'll make the Coinbase case a likely win. So that's all putting the wind into the sails of the cryptocurrency market. The Bitcoin ETFs, of course, themselves, as discussed, bringing potentially $30 billion into the market. It's an if. That's not an if question. It's a when question. That's according to insiders at Fidelity and BlackRock, who seem to know what they're talking about and have been releasing it to people like Mike Novogratz saying, the Bitcoin ETFs coming. This is, it's real. It's happening this time. Then there's Hong Kong. And I know the Hong Kong thing's been a little bit slow. A recap for you. Hong Kong finally passing sweeping cryptocurrency legislation, allowing for Bitcoin ETF products, allowing for retail investors to buy Bitcoin and a range of other cryptocurrencies. That opens up massively to mainland money that might want to come in and get access to Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies because it's not that complicated to get money, especially for rich people from the mainland to Hong Kong or for people to come over with suitcases full of cash and go to brick and mortar dealers because there are brick and mortar Bitcoin dealers in Hong Kong because people do come from the mainland with bags of cash wanting to buy Bitcoin and then take it back into China and sell it on the gray market. And this whole Hong Kong thing, you have to realize, it's happened with Beijing's approval. So Beijing looked and said, yeah, we need to get exposure to this and we can keep stifling it in the mainland because we want to protect our citizens. 
But in Hong Kong, we'll let them be a bit more adventurous. We'll get a, a little slice of that pie because we want a slice of that pie. So China getting back into crypto, that brings lots of potential liquidity into the markets. When we talk about the BlackRock Bitcoin ETF and stuff, that's really just U.S. money, U.S. TradFi money, 30 billion bucks. China's money, China's got a lot of cash. They can bring a lot of cheddar to the cheese plate, so to speak. Then there's the money printing and the interest rate situation. China right now, at the threat of going into deflation, they may have to print hard. They've already been doing more easing. They did easing a few times already. They're probably going to do a lot more easing soon. That means big money printing. That means big injections of cash into the Chinese economy to try and kickstart the engine of China once again. The USA is probably going to have to print too at some point. Now, look, of course, the inflation problem does need to be tamed to the Fed's liking. We're getting pretty close to that situation, assuming we don't have a new massive spike in inflation. But once we see inflation under control, interest rates start getting cut. That, again, potentially puts those uh, wind back in the sails of the market. And that lets them start printing money again because they love printing money. And honestly, they have to print money because the U.S. government's broke. They spend $2 trillion too much every year, more than they have. They're $33 trillion in debt. The only way out of that mess is to print more money. They're addicted to printing money. They're freaking addicts, man. They're out there just every day shooting up more liquidity. Because the system demands it. The banks demand it. The markets demand it. And the Fed, at some point, has got to deliver on it. They can't keep the liquidity taps turned off forever because then America has to go through a brutal withdrawal symptom phase and the economy is not really ready for that with that much debt on board. They need to print, so they will print probably next year. And of course, in the background of all that, there's the increasing threat of de-dollarization, which I know a lot of people get really excited about, you know, oh, it's going to happen overnight or it's never going to happen. Very strong opinions on either side of the situation. But you just have to look at all the news stories that have happened this year. There are increasing moves for countries, including major producers like Saudi Arabia, of oil to move away from complete dollar dominance. Not to say they're totally ditching the dollar, although there has been calls, for example, from uh, Brazil's president, Lula da Silva, to say, especially between the BRICS members, we don't need the dollar. Let's just ditch it. We don't need to use it, which that's a big loss of significance for the dollar as reserve currency status in the world. When other countries start catching on to that, it's problematic. So again, this is a threat to the dollar, but a potential boost for Bitcoin. Then we see, of course, nations mining Bitcoin. We talked about the Amman story the other day. They're investing like a billion bucks into mining Bitcoin. A country's mining Bitcoin officially at the government level. We see things like Russia. Um, and their moves towards potentially also um, running state-run Bitcoin mines, but also allowing for Bitcoin to be used in international trade. It's pretty damn interesting to see some of these players that are getting involved in the Bitcoin game globally. We also, of course, have stuff like the legal tender in El Salvador. That's great. And if we see other countries follow along, it's also really exciting. We've seen some cities and some regions and places like Brazil that have allowed it for international payments. but. You know, that's a slow developing story. The legal tender thing's quite contentious, obviously, because governments want the control of the money. El Salvador didn't have control of their money, so it made sense to go down the Bitcoin route. And then at least they're not beholden to what the Fed does because they were using U.S. dollars. They still do use U.S. dollars, but at least now they can have an alternative based on mathematics and sanity versus the craziness that goes on at the Fed. Then, of course, there's all the big adoption stories, which we've been covering here on the channel recently. The X app potentially going to bring 400 million users into Bitcoin. They just got their cryptocurrency license the other day. That's coming. That's happening. PayPal and the PYUSD going to on-ramp 400 million people into the crypto space. And what do people want to do with their stable coins when the markets start trending? They want to buy stuff. What do they want to buy? Often Bitcoin and other cryptos. When what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Mercado Libre, 200 million people being onboarded to USDC across Latin America. Again, that provides a new fiat on and off ramp. That provides the potential for more money to come into the cryptocurrency markets. Because once speculation starts 
running rampant, people with all the stable coins go, oh, I can buy some Bitcoin. And they throw money into Bitcoin. Oh, I can buy some Solana. They throw some money into Solana. That's how it works. On-chain activity, of course, remains super high during this period. Now, that's right across the blockchain space, meaning that this bear market that we've gone through has been so unlike the previous bear markets. We've almost 10 x our user base since the previous bear market. There's 120 million uh, on-chain accounts in the last month that have been used. Huge numbers here. And yeah, okay, some of that's probably people farming airdrops, but still. There's been a definitive increase in people buying and putting Bitcoin in, in cold wallets, playing around on Ethereum, playing around on Ethereum layer twos. And I know it feels kind of quiet because the herd's not here yet, but there are people out there just quietly using cryptocurrencies, blockchains, playing games, using DeFi, whatever it might be, outside of the English-speaking communities as well. I, I don't see what's happening in you know French crypto space or in Korean or Japanese or Filipino crypto space. But those users are coming from somewhere. And we're seeing growth in global adoption. We're seeing places like Argentina, for example, really look to crypto as a way to, well, save themselves, to get into a lifeboat because their own currency is crap. Bitcoin on exchanges continues to go down. We're at like a five-year low. In fact, the amount of Bitcoin on exchanges hasn't been this low since the 2017 bull market peak, which is crazy. And it's only continuing to go down. 60 million millionaires in the world. It's a lot of people. A lot of people with a million bucks or more net worth. Now, right now, those 60 million people, if you only have a million dollars spending $25,000 on one Bitcoin, you know, if you assume you've, your net worth tied up in your house and some stocks and whatever else, that's a lot of money for a lot of people. Even the millionaires who are single-digit millionaires have one or two million dollars. Buying one Bitcoin might be a bit of a big, a big ask for some of those people. When you start to get up to people with a few million bucks or more, yeah, you buy a Bitcoin, that's fine. So let's say that qualifies 45 million of the millionaires. Well, there's only two million Bitcoin on exchanges. I'm not exactly you know the super mathematician of the world here, but I'm pretty sure that 45 million millionaires cannot all have one Bitcoin if there's only 2 million Bitcoin for sale. Of course, they can't all have one Bitcoin if there's only 21 million maximum supply, but only 2 million left on exchanges, which is pretty interesting if you ask me. That money is going to come, and the Bitcoin having is getting closer every 10 minutes when we have a new block of Bitcoin. April next year, Bitcoin having. Can you hold on till then? Can you make it? Can you survive? Can you last? Can you not get chopped up in 2023 chasing scams? Can you be patient enough for the Bitcoin having to happen, for the new cycle to take off? Because again, if you're here now and you're looking forward and you can maintain until late 2024, mid 2025, you're probably going to be okay. Look, at the end of the day, you either see the big picture of what's going on in this market or you don't. And I think the people who don't, they're the ones who come in and they buy the next bull market top and they sell the next bear market bottom, registering massive losses. Packing up, going away for four years until the next time they come and do it again. But if you do see the big picture, then your chance of securing your financial freedom, I think remains relatively high in this market. Okay. Now, let's talk about, well, BRICS and World War III and de-dollarization and dollar dominance and where the world's going. And it's a topic that I don't want to stray into being hyperbolic about anything. I try to look at what's going on in a geopolitical sense in the world What's going on with the money of the world? Because the people who control the money, the people who control the central banks, really control the central banks, the people who are the masters of the universe, so to speak, they don't want to lose power. And there are certain countries that are not really in the club, Russia, China, some others. And so we see a situation where we have the incumbent, the U.S. dollar, 
coming up against rivals for the first time in a long time. I feel like the rise of BRICS and that grouping and what they're doing with moving away from the dollar is probably the most significant geopolitical event since the fall of the USSR. Let me know if you think the same, or am I just totally crazy here? Let me know in the comments section, of course, if you think that the rise of BRICS is a massively significant geopolitical event in the world. Now, I want to share a few news pieces with you here, why I think some of this might be the case. So this is from Gold Telegraph. They said that the United States is seeking assurance that Saudi Arabia will continue to price its oil in U.S. dollars and not in Chinese currency. They say we are in a financial war and many don't even know it. We are indeed in a financial war. And there's lots of little pieces to that financial war from the sanctions regime to what we see happening with countries moving away from the dollar for oil and gas sales, whether it be in rupees or yuan or rubles, or whatever else it might be. We're seeing a lot of national currencies starting to be exchanged between major players globally. But also... Think about where we are. Because remember back in was it 71 or 70, Richard Nixon made a deal with Saudi Arabia. They said, hey, America's military might is going to back you in the Middle East. We're going to protect you guys. But in exchange for that, you need to price your oil in dollars. You need to only accept dollars for your oil. Saudi said okay, and that was the birth of the petrodollar and the insured dominance of the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency, which meant that every country in the world basically had to have dollars in order to buy anything they needed, whether it be oil or gas, which of course is the commodity that makes the world go round, or other things. The U.S. dollar became the monetary oil of the world, one of the most important assets on earth. But massive debt has played a picture using sanctions one too many times as a weapon. The dollar has been used as a very strong financial weapon against very many countries for a very long time. And apparently some countries are getting tired of it. Apparently some countries are getting tired of it. And so the USA, whether threatening or asking or whatever, tone they had this conversation in, the fact that they have to now seek assurances from Saudi Arabia shows you how far we've gotten along in this process. And Saudi Arabia is joining BRICS next year. So where do you think they're going with this? They didn't join NATO. They didn't join some kind of U.S. Um, new alliance. They joined an alliance with China and Russia and Brazil and India, one that is very openly moving against the Western powers. And again, I don't care which side of the conversation you fall in on this, whether you think it's a good thing that BRICS is rising, a bad thing that BRICS is rising. What I'm trying to talk about here is the implications of this situation. It's a big geopolitical situation and affects everything from the dollar to the euro to the yuan to the price of gold to the price of commodities to global shipping to global commodity prices to what's happening with Bitcoin. It's all affected because we live in a global economy where things don't happen in a vacuum. When China sneezes, everyone in the world gets a cold. I guess no pun intended in that. But anyway, <laughs> apparently there was one though. So BRICS just added six new members, of course, of which Saudi Arabia is one, but we also had um, Iran, major oil producer, the United Arab Emirates, uh, major oil producer, we saw Egypt, Ethiopia, and Argentina also added. So if you say that we are not in a financial war, let me present this to you. So the U.S. administration has put forward that NVIDIA's AI chips are now curbed from being sold in the Middle East as U.S. is tightening its semiconductor controls. Now... Do we see a coincidence here that one week ago, around August 24th or something like that, we saw six new members announced for BRICS, three of them being Middle Eastern nations. Now, of course, Iran was already heavily sanctioned by the U.S. 
But Saudi Arabia and the UAE, no. And almost immediately, they are punished or attempted to be punished for joining BRICS. Saying, hey, you know what? Oh, you're going to join BRICS? Well, how about when you don't get any more semiconductors from us? That's an economic war. That's a financial war. Because you have to remember, I honestly don't see a scenario in which the powers that be, the people behind the central banks and their political bootlicking lackeys and the Wall Street bankers and all this stuff, they're not just going to watch the dollar fade into irrelevance. They're not just going to sit back and say, oh, that's okay. You guys can all just start using the Chinese yuan now. That'll be fine. No, no. The USA is not going to let the dollar just fade away without fighting back. That, of course, makes me worry because what's fighting back mean? Now, trade wars are one thing. Trade wars are fine. We can all have our little trade disputes and things we take into the world trade. Okay, fine. That's all good. You can do import controls. You can do finance controls. That's a, a reasonable level of dispute between nations. The problem is, is that how far will the USA go if it really looks like the USA is going to lose the dollar as the global reserve currency? I mean, they don't even want to share it. Imagine if there's a situation where it's okay, half the world's going to use either BRICS countries' national currencies to do their exchanges, or they're going to launch some kind of new gold-pegged currency or something like that. That takes away half of the demand globally for the U.S. dollar. And what happens to the U.S. dollar when it loses half of its demand? Nothing good, because remember, here's some key information for you. Remember this. The USA is currently almost $33 trillion in debt. $33 trillion. $33 trillion is a lot of money. That is the equivalent of, um, I mean, skyscrapers of money. If you took $33 trillion and replaced a bunch of skyscrapers down, down in Manhattan, that would probably be an about an equivalent. We're talking incredible sums of money here, incredible amounts of debt here. And it worries me that the USA is so in debt because when you start when you start getting cornered, you start becoming dangerous and unpredictable. And with $33 trillion in debt, you don't leave yourself a lot of options. $33 trillion in debt is almost an unpayable number. Currently, the USA is spending $2 trillion more a year than it earns which means it's going more and more into debt every single year. That debt's estimated to be at uh, potentially $50 trillion as soon as 2030. How do you repay $50 trillion? The interest alone on $50 trillion. Holy cow. There's not going to be money left to afford anything in the United States. It's going to be nuts. Ay, 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 ay. So... When half the world stops using the dollar and stops demanding the dollar, it reduces the ability of the U.S. Federal Reserve to print money to solve its problems. Because the only way it's able to have $33 trillion in debt, $50 billion, trillion, trillion, trillion dollars, $50 trillion soon, is that they've been the ones with the global reserve currency. There's a massive demand for dollars abroad because of the global reserve currency status. But as that starts to fade even a little bit, it puts their giant pile of debt into question. Now, the world has seen other attempts by much less powerful players to move away from dollar dominance in especially the oil and gas markets. Now, this is from a leaked email. This video is so getting demonetized, by the way. But anyway, this is from a leaked email from um, uh, Hillary Clinton. Now, this is talking about Libya and Gaddafi's gold and silver reserves. So, 
Most astounding is the lengthy section delineating the huge threat that Gaddafi's gold and silver reserves estimated 143 tons of gold and similar in silver posed to the French franc in Africa, right? France's neocolonial money in Africa. In place of the noble-sounding responsibility to protect doctrine uh, that was given to the public, there was a confidential explanation of what was really driving the war. So this is from the leaked email. This gold was accumulated prior to the current rebellion and was intended to be used to establish a pan-African currency based on the Libyan golden dinar. The plan was designed to provide Francophone African countries, West African countries, that have basically a neocolonial relationship with the French Central Bank and has an exploitative relationship with the French government where these people's resources are taken away from them. This plan was designed to provide um, with an alternative to the French franc. So basically, there's a lot of people out there who believe that Gaddafi was taken out because of his threat to the French franc, as well as a potential that he was talking about looking at accepting only gold for Libya's oil. That would have been a real threat to a lot of people. You can't have those kind of threats. And we see now some kind of almost um, rebellion against French neocolonial rule in West Africa, Gabon being the latest country rebelling against the French neocolonial franc in West Africa. Of course, France may be responding militarily to some of these situations. Now, that's France, and obviously the USA helped with Libya. But what about this? This is actually from November 13th, 2000, an article in Time magazine. Saddam turns his back on the greenback. So Saddam Hussein stopped looking for getting dollars for his oil. He wanted to start getting euros. And then what happened a couple years later? There was a war. In Iraq, a million people got killed and Saddam Hussein got killed. The message is clear. Do not screw with dollar dominance. And yet, and yet, now we have a situation where some of the world's most powerful countries are screwing with dollar dominance. That has massive implications. Massive implications. So currently, Brazil, Russia, China... Uh, India and South Africa make up the current members of BRICS. We have more members coming soon. So again, as mentioned, we have Ethiopia, Argentina, Egypt, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. We have other members that have applied for membership. Those include massive players like Bolivia, which is one of the biggest uh, proven deposits of lithium in the world. Massive, massive, massive. Of course, Argentina is also a major lithium producer. Venezuela, the biggest proven oil reserves in the world. Algeria, one of the top uh, oil and gas producers in the world. I think the 15th uh, biggest reserves of oil and gas in the world. Uh, we see the Democratic Republic of Congo looking to join, which has some of the biggest mineral deposits on Earth, particularly for lithium and cobalt, which is needed for all that new technology that's being built. We see Indonesia. We see Thailand. We see Vietnam. Massive, massive economic players in Southeast Asia, see Kazakhstan, another major oil and gas producer globally. Times are a changing, and we see a new economic union forming up that is too big to avoid. And it makes me worry, again, that the U.S. will not let the U.S. dollar go quietly into that good night, that there could be a stronger reaction to the rise of BRICS. And God, I hope not. I just want to say that. I hope not. I hope not. I hope cooler heads will prevail. Let it just be a, a silly trade war or tip for ta uh, you know, tariffs and all that BS. That's fine. That's fine. Don't draft my children into some BS war, man, over who's going to, who's, whose currency is going to be the reserve currency of the world. It doesn't matter. Just buy Bitcoin, damn it. Come on, guys. Buy Bitcoin. What are we, what are we, what is all this crap about anyway? Why do countries have to do this? It's crazy stuff. Anyway, let me know your opinion on all this. Bit of a rant for you today, of course, on all this stuff. But I think these geopolitical situations are incredibly important to know about as an investor because this kind of news has the potential to change a lot of things in the world. And I hope that they change for the better and peacefully, obviously. Anyway, 
Let's do some questions. Let's do some Q and A. Let's get. It's a bit heavy, huh? It's a bit heavy. Let's let's switch it up. Let's let's talk about some altcoins. Let's talk about some crypto questions, guys. What do you got for me? Hit me up in the in the chat here. Let's talk crypto. Let's talk some altcoins or something like that. Some fun stuff. Let's 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 do some fun. Or we can go more deep, dark stuff too. That's also fun. But uh, let me know your questions. I'll stick around for the 10 minutes. So answer some questions for you guys in the live chat. And of course, thank you so much for those of you who are in the live chat today. I see you there. Thank you. I see you guys talking to each other. So super excited to uh, see you guys there hanging out. So it's great. It's great. A uh, little pause says, I really like these live chats. I have a shit life for 10 years. Crypto BTC and great finance influences like yourself have been helping me keep going. That's great, man. I'm, I'm super excited to see you here. I'm glad you're enjoying the live chats. I'm loving the live chats. Um, yeah, I, I think they've been a lot of fun. We're going to keep doing live chats. I think they're great. I hope they're providing value for you guys. And I'm just having fun doing them. Hoping that you're having fun doing them too. So yeah, let's hope, let's hope the bull market comes back and you feel a bit better about life, man. I hope so. Okay. We're on to our next one. Um, What's well, a good question? Hedy Shada, how do you think the current economy could impact the next bull run? Great question. I feel like that's the elephant in the room. And sometimes I don't even know what to think about it because there's so many people calling for economic Armageddon, the new Great Depression, all this kind of stuff. And look, even stuff like the BRICS story, it kind of fits in with that picture of we're in uncertain times and markets don't like uncertainty. We'll see. I, I feel like there still could be a lot of, there could be a lot of continued economic uncertainty because as those interest rates keep rising in the USA, they keep breaking things. They keep sucking money out of all kinds of places and they make it harder for companies to borrow money, which makes it harder for them to hire new people and expand and all that kind of stuff. So the knock-on effects from what's happening in the USA right now economically are potentially huge. So it's definitely a situation where I know a lot of people keep saying the end of the world's almost here, almost been here for a while now, kind of feels like we are chicken little saying the sky's falling all the time. I don't want to fall into the trap of being overly negative towards everything, but I also don't want to fall into the trap being overly optimistic. So I'm trying to keep an eye on some of these really negative stories um, and so the really negative charts. And I feel like I need to do a video for you guys soon on a potential credit event, what that would be, what that could look like if it were to happen, as well as some other just worrisome statistics and charts that I've been seeing coming out of, well, particularly the U.S. economy. We could also look at some other economies too. We just talked about China the other day. We got we to gotta do some other economies too to balance it out, right? Can't just pick on China all the time. Okay. Uh, where's the next one here for us? OG contraband. Do you think Elon Musk was targeted legally after those big crypto announcements recently? Well, you know, what's interesting is that... Um, Remember back in the day, Facebook was going to launch DM, which was going to be a stable coin. And that was basically shut down by the powers that be, which was so stupid, to be honest. Because I always thought the USA has just screwed this up so bad. Had they simply come out and said, you know what? DM is great. That's an American company, Facebook. And we're going to have the full support of the U.S. government. The Federal Reserve is going to get behind it. The U.S. Treasury Department is going to get behind it. We're going to make this like the global dollar coin. And we're going to extend U.S. dollar dominance another 20 damn years because we're going to have Facebook, which has 2 billion users all over the world, integrate a U.S. dollar wallet on the blockchain. It's going to be awesome. They didn't do that. They said, we're going to shut that down. Yeah. You see these U.S. Paul, do you guys see Mitch McConnell? yesterday i mean gosh let mitch mcconnell retire it's elder abuse at this point man i feel bad for the guy i really do he just had another senior moment where he just totally blanked out dude these are the people running the world holy cow of course they don't understand crypto man Jeez, louise yeah as techworm says they didn't want facebook to become the biggest bank overnight well, that's what Elon Musk wants to do with the X app. He wants it to become the biggest bank overnight, basically. And um, I, he's going to get pushback on that. He's going to get pushed. He's already getting pushback on that. So we'll see. Elon's pretty ballsy. Will he pull it off? I hope so. Be great. Be great to see X really taken off like that. Dilber uh, asks, dot or link? Well, 
Personally, I'm more excited about Link these days. I feel like Link's got so many interesting catalysts coming. Polkadot, they they gotta they gotta put in some work. And look, developers are still there on Polkadot. Lots of things still happening on Polkadot. They have Polkadot 2.0 coming out with renewed economics for the token ecosystem. So that could be a game changer. We shall see. Obviously, lots of competition in the layer one blockchain space, but I don't feel like there's a lot of competition for Chainlink. Chainlink is so freaking dominant in its niche and we see swift and we see major international banks working with chain link like oh, you know, chain link man chain chain link all right uh we're up to next twitch mcconnell link's gonna reach 100 bucks oh yeah oh yeah katie prayers to maui yes yes indeed it's been so shocking what happened in lahaina you know, it's funny. I remember I used to work in Hawaii back in the day, back in the day, it's a long time ago, working in Hawaii um, for a little bit. And I remember one of the first days I was working on a cruise ship, actually, when I was like 19, is it 18? No, 19, just turned 19. Anyway, besides the point. And I remember I got a day off, which is pretty rare on a cruise ship. It's like, all right, I'm, we're on Maui. I'm going to go and I'm going to hitchhike to Lahaina. It was great. It was great. A lot of fun. Got picked up by some cool people. Hitchhiking is always a good time. Uh, well, most always good time. Back up, picked up by some cool people, went out to Lahaina, just had this great time, saw the banyan tree, went down to the waterfront, got some food. It was great. Beautiful little town. Ah, it's a tragedy what happened there, and a tragedy about the, really, the response. You know, it's a, two weeks for anybody to even do anything, and they get, what, 700 bucks per family or something? It just, it hurts. It hurts seeing that kind of stuff, man. Absolutely. Okay, where are we at? Um... Do, 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 do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Looking for a good question here. Uh, thoughts on Solana. We've talked about Solana a bit recently, but just I'll just say quickly to reiterate previously shared thoughts on Solana from the last couple of streams. Solana definitely surviving the bear market. Um, They've had good uptime. That's great. They have, I think, proved a lot of the haters wrong. That Shopify partnership, huge, huge potential implications there. So definitely, definitely something worth keeping an eye out uh, for how that integration moves going forward with Solana Pay because Shopify is like massive beyond belief. So yeah, I, I don't, again, I don't particularly own much uh, Solana. If you want to see my full portfolio, my full disclosures, that link's always in the description of these videos. But um, yeah, definitely I was overly pessimistic, I think, on Solana after the FTX collapse, and they are um, definitely putting in the work here. So I'm happy to see it. I never want to see anyone's bags go to zero. I never want to see anybody lose money in this market. So if you're a Solana bag holder, I hope that you get new all-time highs in the next market cycle okay we're up to uh do one or two more and then we'll finish up for today do 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 shane asks on the days that ethereum is deflationary where does the negative amount come from so that comes from uh fee burning so basically when you have days of high activity on chain for ethereum that will see um, uh, basically a certain amount of Ethereum being burned. So I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but the, the current issuance for Ethereum is very low. And when we have a high activity day, that means that the burning from the fees outpaces the Ethereum that was issued that day. So that's where it comes from. We are burning fees all the time. And as more economic activity heats up, as we see more demand for usage of the key, uh, the main Ethereum blockchain, we will see more fees being burned over time, which means that the supply of Ethereum becomes more deflationary over time. Okay, last one for today. What do we got here? Jake, loving the lives, even if I haven't been active in them all. Gives me a nice way to unwind before bed. Nice. Happy to hear it, man. Happy to hear it, of course. Good night to you soon because we're about to end the, end the stream for today. Jeff, good day from Australia. Hey, what's up, man? Good, good morning. Good morning. Wow. Depends on where you are. I guess it's uh, midday. Maybe you're on the lunch break if you're in Sydney or if you're over in Perth. Good morning. <laughs> Australia is a big country. Australia is a big country. Uh, Nick asks, there's a good fun question. Is New Zealand adopting crypto anytime soon? I think not. <laughs> I think not. I feel like New Zealand has been woefully behind on any kind of 
real sort of serious crypto uh, regulation. I wish they would do something more serious about it because the current crypto landscape in New Zealand leaves a lot to be desired. It's taxed terribly in New Zealand. <sighs> yeah, not the best. Come on, New Zealand politicians, get something done. Okay. Okay. All right, guys, that's it for today. Thank you for coming again to the live stream. Thank you for asking great questions, and I will see you next time. Peace out till then. I hope you have a great weekend.